Right, we're going straight on to our next speaker, who is the Chief Executive of Scottish Power. And there's no industry, perhaps more than the energy industry, where this conversation about decarbonisation, uh, the path to a decarbonised economy, is perhaps more important. So please join me in welcoming to the stage Keith Anderson, Chief Executive of Scottish Power. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Greg. Uh, for the introduction, and it's uh, always a pleasure to follow some uh, great speakers from the political, business, and academic world as well. Um, there is, uh, as you'll have heard already, no doubt that decarbonising the economy in time to meet Scotland's 2045 or the UK's 2050 target uh, is ambitious and challenging. And as a representative of the energy sector, uh, there's a huge amount we, as a company in our sector, can do to get the whole country on that right pathway and the pathway to electrification of areas like transport and heat as well. Um, but as challenging as that 2045 and the 2050 targets are, there's another target we need to hit before them. And that's the target uh, that our industry is particularly focused on, which is the target to decarbonise the power sector by 2035. And that's only 12 years away. Uh, which is really not very long at all. Um, and to get there, or to have a chance of getting there, we need to speed up the investment in green technology and green generation um, threefold, fourfold, fivefold. Um, if we don't hit the 2035 target, um, most people will tell you it becomes impossible to hit 2045 or 2050. Uh, and that's why the focus really, really has to be on getting to that 2035 target and making sure we get there uh, as quickly as possible. Um, the warning bells and the alarms have been ringing over the last wee while around this. Um, over the last few months, we've seen reports from the government's own net zero review, from the National Audit Office report, uh, from the Climate Change Committee's report, and also from the House of Commons Business Select Committee all warning that we are not on target to hit 2035. We're going to miss that target and therefore 2050, 2045 become out of reach as well. Now, what I'll be clear on is there's no shortage of investment to date and there's been a lot of progress made in the country to date in terms of what we've done and what we've delivered. But we need to do much, much more. Um, at Scottish Power, We've been on this trajectory for the last 15 to 20 years of decarbonising our company and our business and helping to decarbonise the country. We were the first integrated energy company to get rid of all thermal generation and move to 100% renewables. And we're now powering more than 2 million homes with the 40 onshore, offshore and solar projects that we have. We're investing £10 billion between now and 2025 we're spending at least £8 million every day, and all of that money is going in towards decarbonisation uh, and trying to get the country ready for decarbonisation. On top of what most people understand we do, which is onshore wind, offshore wind and solar, uh, we're also looking at battery storage. We're looking at the green hydrogen economy. We've got our first two hydrogen projects uh, going into the planning system uh, and, and looking to try and build those, one of which is just outside Glasgow and the other one up in the north of Scotland. Because we need to make the most of all the technologies we have and all the ways we have of getting to that 2035 target. We've got about 70,000 miles of electric cable going across central and southern Scotland, down into Merseyside and into the north of Wales as well. And that's putting green power straight into people's homes and into businesses helping them make the choices about how they decarbonise, how they get electric vehicles up and running, and how they switch heating as well. And then we also have a retail business where we're trying to offer people products that help them make choices around transport, around solar panels, and around heating. Everything we're doing as a company, and everything we talk about as a company, we do through the prism of net zero and getting to that net zero destination. We're in the process of recruiting 1,000 people Every one of those thousand jobs is targeted at getting us to net zero and getting us to full decarbonisation. So, with all of that momentum, 
everything we've achieved so far, what we're doing as a company, and there are other companies following us as well, doing exactly the same thing. Why is it we're not on target? And the answer is simple. The solution is more challenging, but the answer is simple. The simple answer is it's speed. We're just not going fast enough. We need to go three, four, five times faster than we've gone to date. So as much as this country's done, as much as the UK has achieved, as much as we've done in offshore wind and onshore wind, and we're doing in solar, we need to do four or five times the amount, and we need to do it in a shorter time period. And that's the size and the scale of the challenge that lies ahead of us. At COP26, and I heard Anton talking about COP as well, you know, the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero was set up, which was a great uh, forum and a great step forward. It looked at getting and pulling together all the power of the finance sector in terms of putting money forward uh, to tackle decarbonisation around the world and help this country as well. And if anything, the horrible and horrific events that we've seen over the last couple of years have actually cemented the importance of what was agreed at COP26 the importance of that finance community focusing on how we do this around the world, the importance of the world thinking about how do we shift away from fossil fuels, the importance of the world thinking about how do we build and accelerate investment into renewable technology and electrification. And those targets are incredibly important and the ambitions are incredibly important. And it's on the back of that that the real value of programmes like Scotland around the coast of Scotland, which is looking at floating offshore wind, are so vital to the future and the ability to hit the targets. And there are also now massive plans for an upgrade and an investment in the strategic part of the transmission system, again, which is a vital part of that journey to get us all to net zero. So, right now, today, uh, more than ever before, we have got a very, very clear picture of the destination and where we need to get to. And We've got a very, very clear understanding of all the technology that we have today to get us there. And as it was stated in the Committee on Climate Change report several years ago, we have all of the technology available to us today to get to that target and to hit 2050. All of that technology exists. It's now about how do we go from here to here. And that's the bit we make difficult for ourselves. That's the bit we keep tripping ourselves up on, and that's the bit we need to simplify. As a country, we've got a habit of doing things the way we used to do them. We've got a habit of making small tweaks and small changes to processes, and we've got a habit of just copying what we've done in the past because we think we've done quite well. But what we did show during a pandemic, and what we've shown during the energy crisis, is we can move fast when we're in an emergency. When we really think something needs fixed, we can change processes, we can rip up the rule books, we can do things differently, and we can approach things differently, and we can do it together. And it shows you what can be achieved and what we can do. And the good news for us, in terms of getting to net zero, there is no shortage of investment. There are investors out there falling over themselves to invest in the future of sustainability. It doesn't matter whether it's renewables projects, whether it's onshore wind or offshore wind, whether it's hydrogen, whether it's the grid system. There are lots and lots of people out there willing to invest in its future. The challenge is just about every other country in Europe and in America and around the world is trying to do the same thing. And so we're all after the same money, we're all after the same investors, and an even bigger challenge right now is we're all after the same supply chain and to get the same goods and the same materials into our country. We can't match what's going on in America. We can't match their Inflation Reduction Act. We cannot match fiscally the support mechanisms that exist in the EU. But what we can do is we can be smarter better and faster than them. And in a world where speed and time is precious, and in a world where clarity and certainty is precious, they are every, every bit as valuable as a tax break, 
a fiscal mechanism or a support mechanism. And that lies within the control of this country. It doesn't cost money to fix the problems we have, and it doesn't cost money for us to get faster. And the importance of speed is not just its value to me, but speed is incredibly valuable to me, as is clarity and certainty. The real importance is what it does to the economy. Because the more clarity, certainty, and speed I have, the more it benefits the whole of the economy. I create contracts, I create supply chain investment, I create jobs, and it ripples all the way down through to every community across the country. And that's what we need to be focused on and achieving, is the benefit it brings to businesses. And this isn't just about huge big international manufacturers or huge big tier one civil engineering companies. This is about survey firms, it's about security companies, it's about bed and breakfasts, it's about sandwich shops. It's about investment all the way down into the local community that can benefit from what we need to do and what we want to do. Last year, I awarded two billion pounds of contracts. Over 50% of it went into UK content. This year, I'm planning to end up this year creating six billion pounds worth of contracts. And again, the target is well over 50% of that goes into businesses directly in the UK. But it's not just about those big contracts, it's also about the other money we invest and spend locally. The last time we built an offshore wind farm in East Anglia, there was an additional 76 million pounds went into local companies during the construction programme. 14 million pounds into catering and office supplies in local companies. 30 million pounds into strengthening the port infrastructure for future investment and future projects. And that's another 150 million pounds into local towns and villages in the area. And that's the benefit of what we're trying to do and what we're trying to bring right across the whole of the country. We're committed to doing that and more with Scotland as we build out floating offshore wind around this country. Medium and small sized companies are the lifeblood of our economy and we need to make sure they get their equal share of the pie that we get that benefit spread right down through the, through the economy, right down into our local communities. Whether that's done through supplier days, whether it's done through interaction, whether it's done through partnerships, whether it's working with local, local authorities and local governments, we need to look at every way of getting the benefit spread across the whole of the country. So, alongside the big construction, alongside the, man, uh, the management of our assets, Part of our role is also to help businesses unlock their own net zero potential. And that's also what we're trying to do. So through our networks business, as we roll out the network, delivering green energy right across the country, that makes that green energy accessible to homes, to customers, but also to businesses, to help them thinking about how they decarbonize. We're there to help people look at EV charging, public charging, rooftop solar, battery solutions, heat installations, all to offer solutions to help businesses decarbonize and help the whole economy get to net zero as well. So, whilst the warning lights are flashing around the targets, the size of the prize remains the same. This is a huge economic prize for this country to go after, as well as tackling the obvious climate emergency. And the conclusion I end up coming to, to now, in terms of the risk of us not hitting the targets, is we know we can go fast when we're in an emergency. The fact we're not going fast enough today suggests to me we don't really still see this as an emergency. I think just about every speaker I'll hear today, every speaker I hear at every conference I go to, refers to this as a climate emergency. We don't treat it like that. We don't act as if it's an emergency, and we're not on a trajectory as if we're behaving it's an emergency. And that's the biggest thing we need to change as a country. Thank you. Keith, thank you very much indeed. You said so many important things, but your absolutely underlying point 
was that we're not moving fast enough. Yep. And you've just reiterated that at the end. But you also said that you're following a 2035 target, you're focusing on battery, on hydrogen, on a more distributed grid. You talked about choices for consumers and for businesses. You went all the way through the, the opportunities with supply chain, with distribution, the, the floating offer as part of Scotland. There's so much in what you said that was brilliant, and thank you very much. Now, four questions have come in, and I wonder if we can have a quick go at them. Sure. So um, uh, the first question asked by Mark Murley basically says that you know, you're generating a lot of investment in wind turbines, which is absolutely fantastic, but is too much of it being outsourced to other countries? Is there an opportunity to source more of the wind turbine technology in Scotland and in the UK? Uh, yes, there is more of an opportunity, is the short answer to that. So one of the biggest conundrums we need to solve in this country around how we do this and how we invest all of this money is how we also engage the supply chain and get the investment into the country. Now, we've had a big, a big win recently in Scotland. There's been the announcement about Sumitomo coming to build a cable factory, and that's a great example. Okay? Mm. There is a massive worldwide shortage of cable. Mm. Sounds daft, but it's the truth. Mm. Right now, if you're bidding for a project, whether it's building a wind farm or doing a grid project, there is a huge race on to buy up cable capacity. There are German companies out there right now buying up capacity in the supply chain market for the next 10 years mm. for their cable commitments. Mm. And so we need these companies to come to the UK. The difference and what we need to tackle is the way we do our planning system versus the way we do our, whether it's regulatory or market incentive mechanisms and the way we engage with the supply chain. They are disjointed at this point in time. Mm. So, typical example, a company will come and say to me, Keith, we're thinking about building a wind turbine tower factory in the UK. Mm. When can you give me an order? Mm. My answer, I don't know. I don't know when I'll get a planning consent. I don't know when I'll get an auction out of a CFD contract. Mm. So I don't know when I can build a product. This is your speed point again. And this is an issue about speed and an issue about linkage of mechanism and a linkage of process. And we need to pull all of that together. And one of the things we're talking to the government about, both south and north of the border, mm. is turning this into a business plan. Scotland's a great opportunity to build a huge business plan mm. that shows the clarity to inward investors and to supply chain. Here's the size of the prize. Mm. Here's all of the projects. Here's the timeline for the projects. We, the government, can tell you, here's when the planning decisions will be made, and we, the government, can tell you, here's when contracts will be awarded. Yeah. If you can give that to supply chain investors, they will flock to this country. Right, so you're making your key point that this doesn't just help you with speed, but it also helps you to onshore more of the value. Absolutely. Right. Yep. Great. Now, there's another question, quite a sharp one here. 17 people in the room would like to know what you think about this. They're making the point that the Scottish powers... Uh, uh, Scottish Power is, has ha had rising energy bills, both for citizens and for businesses. I'm yep. sure you answer this question all the time. And they ask whether the price of energy is both affordable and sustainable. Is there anything you can do about that? Fine. Okay. So, um, the price of energy has gone through the roof. Yeah. Okay. So, about 18 months, two years ago, a, a typical household, it's a very weird concept as to what a typical household mm. is, but it, about 18 months, two years ago, a typical household would have paid £1,200 a year. Mm. Okay? That went up to over £4,000. Right now, today, it's still over £3,000. Mm. Okay? Um, by July, all of the predictions for the price cap are it will come down to about £2,000, just over £2,000. Okay? That price now is set by the regulator, independently of me. Mm. Okay? And just about every uh, domestic consumer is on a regulated tariff right now. Mm. We have, in effect, closed down the competitive market mm. because of the gas crisis and the price crisis. The biggest challenge for us is, as it comes down to that £2,000, okay, that's still almost 100% more than it used to be. Mm. Okay? And I think one of the challenges with the politicians, the regulator, the media is people are thinking, fantastic, it's come down to 2,000, because it was at 4,000. Mm. 2,000 is a huge amount of money, mm. and there is absolutely a part of society who will struggle to pay for it, who cannot afford to pay for it. Mm. Okay? Um, 
and that's the issue we need to tackle, is affordability. Mm. So what do we do? Because right now, all of the forecasts tell us and the market the price is likely to stay at or around £2,000 mm. for the next 12 to 18 months. Mm. Now, markets can change, commodities can fluctuate, but any forecast right now will tell you that. Mm. That's a lot of money for people to pay and afford. What can I do as a company? I can work with the regulator, but the way that price is set right now by the regulator is it allows an energy company retailing gas and electricity to make a 1.9% margin, mm. maximum. 1.9%, mm. okay? So there is no one making a huge profit out of retailing gas and electricity. Mm. Those are the real prices, mm. uh, and that's the real impact of it. Mm. What we need to do as a society, with the government and with the regulator, is say, how do we help and support the people who cannot afford that? Mm. Is it a social tariff? Mm. Is it a payment through universal credit? Mm. What mechanisms do we employ? And that's what needs to be done, and very, very quickly. Very, very clear. Thank you very much, Keith. We're going to take two more, if we may, uh, but we need to do them quite quickly. So uh, the next question is really about micro-businesses. You talked about SMEs and how important they were. Yep. Um, are you offering particular services or advice? You know, your 1,000 new recruits. I'm sure there'll be many candidates in the room, by the way. But uh, uh, are you, up, please, are you, you offering are. particular help to, to enable small businesses to understand how they can reduce their carbon? Yeah, so through our retail business, we're working with, with companies to try and offer potential solutions or, or you know, future solutions, mm. whether that's through the conversion of heating, mm. uh, whether it's through buying renewable energy, uh, whether it's through uh, looking at their fleet business uh, and, and converting it to EVs and putting in the EV infrastructure. So we're happy to engage with any business, uh, individual customers, about what, what choices do you have, how can you do it, will help get people access to grant funding. So there's grant funding available for heat pumps, there's grant funding available for EV charging, et cetera, and make sure people get access to all of those support mechanisms as well. Absolutely. Right. Wonderful. And then the final question, Keith, is from Gregor Urquhart. Thank you, Gregor. What's your take on limited grid capacity for decarbonizing the network and being able to support the power required for net zero. Recent, support, recent reports, he suggests, say that there have been lots of delays in increasing capacity in the projects. Is that what you were referring to? Fine, so there are, there are yeah, there's a big topic of debate right yeah. now, and I'll try and be very, very brief. There are two issues on the grid. Yeah. Uh, one issue uh, is around uh, future investment, okay? And, We've been running a grid system for the last 20 years based off, in effect, sweating assets. We've now got an agreement with the regulator that we need to invest ahead of time. So there is now a huge multi-billion pound investment program to build the next 25 to 30 strategic transmission lines mm. in this country to allow us to hit mm. the 2030 50 gigawatt mm. offshore wind and onshore wind target. Mm. Okay? That's now been approved by the regulator. Mm. Challenge, last time we tried to get a 400 kV transmission line built in Scotland, mm. it sat in the planning system for 10 years. Mm. Okay, that's 2033 at best. Mm. So we need to half the time in planning, mm. at least half the time in planning, to allow us to get it built for 2030. Yeah. That's the size and scale of the challenge. So we've got the money, we wanna build the projects, speed. Yeah. Second part of the issue is the grid queue, and that's what lots of people are talking about, is if they come and apply right now to build a small wind farm or a battery project or a hydrogen project, they're getting told the grid queue's fuel, you'll have, you'll have to wait for five years, ten years. Mm. Okay? There's a process again underway right now to clear a whole lot of projects out of the grid mm. queue. Mm. There are people who have asked for grid connections or inquired for grid connections where their projects are making no, pro no progress, they're not going through the planning system, mm. but they're taking up and blocking up grid capacity. Mm. We need to clear all of that out and free up the grid capacity and look at the priority projects and get them built fastest. That review is underway right now. Keith, thank you so much for your leadership here, because what you've done in this last answer is to really underline the key point of your whole message, which is, if this is a climate emergency, 
It requires the speed that we normally use in an emergency, and in particular, in these big infrastructure projects that are essential to reshore, to onshore, and to decarbonize the energy system, what you need is aligned government decision-making yep. to make it much easier. Ladies and gentlemen, Keith Anderson, thank you very much. For the